that sort of uh, design work that was going on with it. Um, just to give you a little bit of a sense of what I, I was looking at, so I got a little more interested in, you know, what is Art Nouveau? How does it relate uh, to my own research? And just to do a quick overview, apparently everything is elongated on this screen, so just kind of squash it around a little bit. Um, so um, I, it really arose from the arts and crafts movement. Uh, I, it, sometimes I, I go back and forth between calling Art Nouveau a movement and Art Nouveau as a design sense. We think of it over time, I think, and place it in the realm of design, but it really kind of was an art movement. Um, in, in the arts and crafts movement itself, it kind of uh, rebelled against the, the uh, Victorian fussy style and also was looking for a design sensibility that that um, incorporated the importance of craft and craftsmanship and put it at the same level as uh, high art, essentially painting, sculpture, and that sort of thing. Um, it, the uh, Art Nouveau style also drew heavily from Japanese woodblock print that was kind of in vogue at the time that was the, the new art style being discovered. And you'll see within Art Nouveau that classic sort of whiplash line really goes a lot to the line in woodblock print. Um, you will see Art Nouveau or hear Art Nouveau refer to several different styles. It's kind of one of those odd styles that seem to crop up simultaneously or close one to another in multiple sites. So uh, in, in France, uh, it was more Art Nouveau, uh, Forza style in Belgium, uh, Guggenstiel in Germany, the secession movement in, in Austria, uh, many different things. Literally a modern style was more um, in England, modernismo in, um, in Spain, and particularly in Bar Barcelona it was modernismo, and then uh, Stile Liberty for Italy. Italy wasn't a big place for it, but uh, it did occur somewhat there. What I found interesting about this was the crossover for Art Nouveau happening both in the craft style on the right-hand side and in high art, painterly sort of looks. What I found really fascinating is if you look at the patterns in this, they're really you know, kind of speaking to one another pretty heavily. And what I found fascinating about this was based in some of, this is some of my uh, older work, it's maybe about 10 years old now. Um, I had at an early period had been interested in what is design surface, how does surface work to function and form. Um, I, I, my work is really narrative, it's more about storytelling, it's more uh, about asking questions that are both personal and political, uh, looking a lot at the idea of eroticism and, eroticism and homoeroticism itself and trying to present sexuality, especially male sexuality, as something that um, one can talk about um, I, I, I find fascinating within the realm of art history and even within our own uh, daily lives that um, there is, uh, we will talk about female sexuality because males can dominate that conversation. So it's almost a power sort of thing. And I'm interested in deconstructing that power construct and uh, revealing um, the sexuality of males and making that something that, you know, you can't own that paternal sort of sensibility that you have to make your own self vulnerable, I guess, and, and I, know, I can go on about that. But, um, so I was really interested based in that, particularly this started out as looking at uh, the, the homoerotic approaches to male in Art Nouveau design, pretty specific, trying to figure out where that would happen, was looking a lot at the work of Aubrey Beardsley and, and that very tongue-in-cheek, very in-your-face approach um, to sexuality, whether it was from a homoerotic bent or not. Um, I happened, this was kind of one of those trips where I got there five minutes too late. So I got there right after a major Aubrey exhibition, Aubrey Beardsley exhibition closed and moved on, and, and there were other things that happened like that. Um, I, I um, you know, found that this sabbatical trip became, let's see where this goes and how it relates. So I started looking at different approaches and, and was still looking at that imagery that was um, pseudo-homoerotic. I did research in Paris, um, London, and Brussels. 
just tracking down different sources, a bit of the arts and move, uh, arts and crafts movement, the, the modern style, uh, a bit of Art Nouveau, a bit of secessionist uh, sort of art, and uh, looking at some of the art, um, some art that really did not relate to Art Nouveau directly as well, but were real um, uh, significant artistic events or individuals that I think play in my artwork or that, that I was looking at. Um, found that I was doing a lot more work with Gustav Klimt's work and his penchant, penchant for design. Very, very highly um, evolved and sorry that's just the gym. I'm very busy. Um, was looking also at the whiplash line. I thought this image was particularly interesting because it's a great image of uh, the trees and then the the uh, entrance to the metro. Obviously, kind of an art design sort of thing with its whiplash line. But since that derives from um, the the uh, plant life around it, organic nature, um, it was a great kind of opportunity to say, see, here's how the lines play with one another. So as I'm going through and looking at all of these pieces, and I'm in Paris, I had the opportunity to, uh, excuse me, to visit the Rodin Museum. And while I was there, this was one of my favorite pieces of his, um, and I had not gotten to see it in person. So I uh, uh, got to show up and see this piece. This is the Gates of Hell. Uh, if you're not familiar with the piece, it's about 12 feet tall, something like that, but it's uh, Rodin's response to Dante's Inferno. And at the top of it are the three shades seen here reproduced. He also did a life-size version or, or a human-sized version of it. But the three shades are, are uh, representative of the damn souls going into hell. So all of this is starting to play on me in terms of how I can look at design and take all of this imagery that I'm seeing and really wonder how it's in. You know, not really affecting my work, but feeding into the work that I was interested in doing um, from the narrative back. Another important thing, this is on the inside of the museum, was looking at Rodin's distorted figures. We always think of more monumental scale sorts of works or works that are more representational, but I got to see images that were maquettes, uh, models of other things that he would like to do, or some of his models that were just deteriorating over time because of the plaster and paper and I, I love that textural sort of surface and incorporate it into my own work. Of course, I had to uh, look at some of the body or work of other artists, which plays into my really worked wit, I think, and in, in my approach to things, and uh, was, was looking at some of the work of the Greeks and going on from there. So with all of this, after the travel to these museums, um, I uh, was accepted into a residency in Rome in which I uh, worked as an artist in residence for five weeks and um, walked on my way every morning. This was, I had to suffer through these landscapes, walking to work, and crossing the Tiber River with my cappuccino. It was really good fun. But, um, no, it was, it was uh, really a great opportunity to really breathe in the textures of, of Rome. And that's what started to play on my mind as well as some of the stories going on around me, sorry. Um, some of the imagery and what lived as high art there, this is the ceiling of one of the churches in the neighborhood I worked. I, uh, the studio was in uh, a portion of a building owned by the Polish embassy, so I walk, would walk through these ruins and then past these fabulous churches and be able to see in one walk these uh, decrepit old doors, which I think are just stunningly beautiful, as well as these incredible soaring heights and ceilings in, in the church next door to it. Um, in this same walk in the neighborhood, I, I got to really engage with work that I found exciting, um, just the, the street art of Rome and their version, in a way, of contemporary art going on, whether it be just general design work, and there are different levels of, of expertise in this, or uh, very political statements of, uh, of the trunk on a little tyke uh, on the right-hand side, and then on the left side is actually a reference to um, a person uh, who is working, I, I believe, within the church, and happened to be lesbian, and was immediately let go 
um, the Polish embassy, and, and Poland is very Catholic, and so these uh, mother and child images were spread all throughout Poland, but someone stuck one here outside of the Polish embassy. I happened to get a picture of it before they ripped it down, so um, it was really having fun with it. So I set to work um, on some of the pieces. Uh, this on the left is the far left is the workspace that I was working in. It's Rome, tight quarters, kind of like living in New York. You use all the space you can get. Um, the, the top right is just the meme and process uh, of one of the pieces, and the Zabon uh, was my initial model, just a small piece that I was patterning after uh, the three shades and, and reinterpreting three shades through my own lens and my own political belt uh, bent. Um, as I was looking around the city, and the last few images here are images that are in the show right now, um, the, all of the works that I did, plus associated works after that are in exhibition, on exhibition at the Miller Gallery right now. Um, so if you have anything going, come down and, and take a look, hopefully. Um, so some of the sites around, for the, the two primary pieces I did, this I, I did five individual pieces, three put together as an installation, one separate, and then a separate one that was left with them as part of the residency program to donate a piece to them, so I don't have that here. Um, as I was walking around, I found these beautiful um, mosaics that, that tied in, uh, let's see, I think that the, it was the Spanish Academy of uh, Art in Rome, or just the Spanish Royal Academy in Rome. Uh, they had these beautiful founts uh, kind of wall founts that were um, inset into the walls in a courtyard that over time had been taken over by the calcium in the water and only the tiles were left and a few decrepit uh, uh, tiles covered by calcium. So I started using some of that imagery thinking about design work as an intentional reference to architectural work and and age and my own experience uh, around the image. And the, this piece, which is about 18 inches tall, um, in response to the piece on the left. Um, and going back to this piece on the three shades, if you look again at the three shades and looking over the gates of hell, I, I started thinking about that just in terms of current um, you know, political climate and, and uh, sensibilities going on and created this version um, of these images uh, overlooking uh, White House, kind of tinted orange. This is done as a uh, ceramic tile, decal inspired onto the surface. Uh, the piece is on the top about 18 inches, the piece on the bottom about 18 inches wide by 12, 13 inches tall, something like that. Um, being in Rome was significant for me in terms of the use of, if, if you've seen those little uh, tiny baby angels, cherubic looking, they're, they're actually called putti and they have their um, their source as these uh, provocative little figures, which is a lot from where the title came from, uh, that were um, kind of aiding the work of Cupid and Eros, really. They're, they're, they come from much more ancient times, and then Renaissance art and the church adopted those images as the cute little cherubs, but they actually have uh, a, a much, uh, much more significant uh, almost muse-like uh, aspect to them, uh, in the sense that a muse might provoke you on and inspire you, and it also might um, just give you that little needle poke in the rib uh, to egg you on to either do good or bad or whatever. And I started finding these, finding these figures um, to relate to my more representational figures as playing off of one another, is what's one, um, evoking a sense of, of um, you know, on emotions and, and ideas and those concepts. So, um, this piece, I'm just going to step here real quickly because I know we're running out of time through the series of them. Um, this was an early piece that happened just before I started sabbatical work. It's tied to the sabbatical and the idea of the sabbatical. It was the earlier explorations of what does design mean. Uh, more than just being decorative. How does it tell a story? How does it get some sort of function going across? Sorry, jumping all over. Um, the, the central piece was a piece that was completed before Rome and after Rome, but definitely influenced by the work that I did in Rome. Uh, the piece 
is roughly about this tall, um, inspired by the, the uh, holy water fount that I found at a consignment shop in New Jersey of all places. And I just I fell in love with it and knew that I could use it for something. And this piece evolved uh, from that. Uh, three of the figures now incorporated as muses, kind of playing off of the figure. Um, it, it, the piece is called The Prank of Mythology and has to do with looking at, um, especially in Western culture, I think we try to derive meaning from multiple religions and capture that into one nice little package that, that defines us by our own strange rules without really understanding what we're doing or knowing. So there are Celtic uh, not images on here. There's references to Western Christianity. There's references to serpent mound imagery, which show up on the smaller images as well. On the, it's hard to tell, but on the back side, actually the serpent mound image going, like the, the serpent heading for the, the egg of, of Southern Ohio and replaced that egg on the back with a Celtic knot. So kind of did a mash up with some of them and then really played with these figures as poking and prodding on the other image. Um, of course, I had to make a reference to to he, who shall not be named again. And um, I, I um, sort of playing with the idea of um, Trump as a black hole, essentially, and, and did the, the uh, blue gem image being sucked into that as a, this is called unnatural disasters as a reference to uh, global climate change and, and that sort of thing. I'm trying to use design to, to impact that. And um, this is the, the final piece. So this piece um, completed literally three days before installation into the current show. And it's just a more personal piece of reflecting on um, uh, myself and my own process. Um, the design on each one of the heads um, has some significance to me in one way or another, um, either personally or, or just through you know, my own personal things. Through, it's hard to believe I'm only seven decades. So I, that just is so, I mean, it's, I, I haven't hit the big seven, but, uh, but you know, I'm heading in that. So it's, it's um, it, it may make reference to each one of those processes. And then, of course, the figure reflects back on itself. In the so the work is, um, it really looks at design, takes design, especially inspired by Art Nouveau, and then tries to apply it to my figures, my, my um, images, and then make sense of that Pouty image as well. Figure. <laughs>